Good morning, God's beloved. Welcome to worship with the University Christian Church. I'm Reverend Megan Pegler, the senior minister here, and I'm so glad to be worshiping with you today. Also, welcome to everyone who is joining us online. Whether you are here in person or online, I'd like to invite you to take a moment to register your attendance with us. Let us know that you were with us today, especially if you are a visitor and we don't already have your contact information because we would love to be in touch and see about setting up some time to get to know one another better. If you find yourself in need of a restroom at any time during the service, you can go through this side door over here at the front and it will point you to where you need to go. Today, this uh, afternoon, is the Crop Walk. This is an annual walk with Church World Service and a whole bunch of other churches from a lot of different denominations. and We are raising money for those who are hungry. Uh, some of the proceeds go to local agencies, including um, IACT, Refugee uh, Services, and then also uh, the Central Texas Food Bank and others. And then some of the proceeds go to support the work of church world service all around the world to help those who are um, food insecure. So there's still time to donate. And also, if you would like to walk, you can still do that even if you haven't signed up yet to be a part of the UCC team. It's at uh, 145, you'll need to be at Camp Mabry to do a check-in if you haven't already registered online to be a part of the team. Uh, there are some opening ceremony type things at 2 o'clock, and then 2.30 is the walk itself. This Saturday on April 1st from 4 to 6, we're having a game, game time event. From, uh, and there, there will be snacks provided. You're invited to bring your favorite games, whether they're board games or card games or any other kind of game. Uh, it's going to be a fun time for us to be together and share our favorites, and this is a really good opportunity to bring uh, friends or family or coworkers or people who might not want their first experience with UCC to be here in the sanctuary. Um, so it's a good time to get to know folks. Speaking of inviting loved ones to church, Easter is coming up. We are just two weeks away from that. Uh, it's going to be a very full and joyful day. Um, we're going to have a brunch at 9.30 before church, and then an egg hunt immediately following that. And the service itself is going to be very special, partly because the choir will be accompanied by orchestra. There will be extra singers as they lead us through. Uh, we will listen to Rudder's Gloria all throughout the service. Uh, it will be split up, and it's going to be a very special presentation. We still have room for the Pisanki class, the Ukrainian Easter egg creation class on April 16th. It's at nine o'clock that morning, and so uh, please reach out to the office if you'd like to reserve one of those spots. And now, beloveds, peace to you, and welcome to this time of worship.
This morning's call to worship are selections from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O God. I wait for God. My soul waits, and in God's hope, God's word I hope. My soul waits for God more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in God. For with God there is steadfast love, and with God is great power to redeem. Please stand in body or in spirit as we sing together hymn number 14. resurrection and life. As we worship you this day, show us who we are, bearers of good news, messengers of resurrection through Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, we will be gathered together in a posture of prayer in just a moment. As we pray, you will notice in the back of your bulletin, we have prayer requests. The new ones are bolded, and we will pray those aloud today. We have one prayer request that was not made, did not make it into our bulletin. Um, it is with tremendous sadness that I share that the Kogler family is no longer expecting. So we will keep them all, Deborah and Adam and Michaela, in our prayers. Siblings, the Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. Out of the depths we cry to you, O God. You hear our voices, and you are attentive to our prayers. We give you thanks for all the many good things in this life. And we repent of all the many ways in which we do not and have not appreciated all of the blessings you've heaped upon us. God, we pray today for everyone who's on our heart. We pray especially for the Koglers. We pray for the loved ones of Charles. We pray for the loved ones of Donna. Oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all of those whose hope is lost, for those who feel cut off from you. By your grace, open their graves and bring them back to the land of the living. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are oppressed, those who are held captive by the power of death, Release them from their chains, unbind them, and let them go. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who weep. We pray for those who are lost and lifeless in fear or regret or mental illness or disease or addiction. God, grant them the peace of your presence and show them what love can do. Oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are dying, the light of life fading in their eyes. God, help them to hold on to faith so they may live and never die. Oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, God, for having heard these prayers, and we now take just a moment to pray to you whatever is in our hearts. Enable us, O oh God, to trust in you and thus to see your glory. We pray these things through Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now the children will come forward for the children's moment.
up low. Are you okay? All right, I'm gonna get closer to y'all. Can you skip back just a little bit and tell the thing? Yeah. Hi, friends. How's it going? Good, everything going well? Did you have a nice week? Good, I'm so glad to hear that. So today we're gonna hear a story about Jesus in a little bit and about his friends and they were named Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Have you heard of Lazarus? You have? Great, I'm so glad you've heard. What do you know about Lazarus? You listen to it at your school. Your school follows the Revised Common Lectionary. That's excellent. What about you, Harry? You probably heard about it when you were at Matilda School. It's a kind of a funny name. It stays with you, doesn't it? Yeah. So. Lazarus had two sisters, and he was really sick, and they were all friends with Jesus. Do you remember this story now? So, Lazarus, you what? You believe me? Okay, good. I won't tell you a false story today, I promise. So he was friend, Jesus was friends with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And Mary and Martha went to find Jesus because Lazarus was really sick, and they thought he was going to die. So they go find Jesus, and they ask him to heal their brother and to make him better. But by the time Jesus got to their house, Lazarus had already died. And his sisters were very sad. And Jesus was also very sad. And in the Bible, it even tells us that Jesus cried because he was so sad that his friend died. I don't know if he cried like that, but... There was a lot of confusion because they felt that surely Jesus could have gotten there faster and healed him before he died. But Jesus said it would all work out. So he went to go find where they put the body of Lazarus. You can touch it, it's fine. Where they put the body of Lazarus. And when he got there, he asked for the big stone to be rolled away. And people thought that would be a bad idea because sometimes dead bodies are stinky. Yeah. Yeah. So they did. But Jesus called to Lazarus, and guess what? He got up and walked out of the tomb. He was alive again. So I think what's really important about this lesson is for us to remember that we can sometimes be like Mary and Martha and think that we know how things are supposed to go and get really, really upset when things don't happen the way we want them to. But ultimately, we are gonna be okay. We just have to take a deep breath when we get sad or we get frustrated and remember that God is going to take care of us. Can you remember that? Yeah, maybe? It's hard, it's hard. As the grown-ups, it's kinda hard to have that faith sometimes. But we're gonna grow into it, okay? Do y'all wanna pray? All right, let's pray. Repeat after me, friends. Dear God, Thank you for Jesus. Help us remember that it doesn't always go the way we want, but really, we're going to be okay. Amen. Okay, guys, have a wonderful week. I'll see you next time.
Today's scripture, not scripture, scripture comes from the gospel according to John chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was that one who was anointed, who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, The illness does not lead to death. Rather, it's for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are not the twelve, are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought they, he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was, the, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you, have, if, you, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still at, a place, at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came, where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, 
you would, have, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you would always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he, said, when he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to, him, to them, Unbind him, let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, pour out your spirit on us that we hear the word you have for us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Spring has officially sprung. New life is all around. I don't know if you have also seen all of the new buds on the trees. My neighborhood is suddenly green again. There are flowers and bees and new life everywhere. We're getting closer to Easter. We're just two weeks away. And so hearing the story about Lazarus today is a bit of a preview, a taste of the new life of resurrection, even though we are still in Lent. This season of Lent, we've been looking at encounters that Jesus had throughout his public ministry, and today, we're gonna focus in especially on those encounters that he had with Mary and Martha, less on his encounter with the dead and then risen Lazarus, and more with his sisters. Jesus was close with these three siblings. A lot of us, when we hear this story, wonder why didn't he immediately go when he heard that Lazarus was sick? And we hear that he died and he'd been in the tomb for four days by the time Jesus moved. This long passage includes a, a significant portion about the nature of grief. We hear a few times throughout the passage about the Jewish people who were there accompanying the sisters through their grief. They surrounded them as they mourned the life of their brother. It said many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. So when they hear that Jesus has finally gotten to move on and come to where they are, Martha goes out to meet him. And unsurprisingly, she expresses her anger. Anger as we all know, is a part of grief. They have a, an interaction back and forth where Martha ends up making the profession of faith that Peter makes in other Gospels, that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. So they have this back and forth, and then she goes home and tells Mary that Jesus wants to see her. So Mary goes, and that crowd of mourners follows her to continue to be with her in her grief, this loving, compassionate presence with them all the way. And we hear about how she kneels at Jesus' feet in a devoted sort of posture. But at the same time, she laments that Lazarus wouldn't have died if only Jesus had been there. And so for those of us familiar with the official five stages of grief, we hear bargaining start to come in there. She was bargaining with the past, if only, if only. And she wept. The other mourners wept too. And seeing this moved Jesus. He said, where have you laid him? 
And they said, come and see. And we know from all of our other readings of scriptures that come and see is usually the invitation that Jesus gives. And that's when people start on their path of discipleship, following in the footsteps of Jesus. Come and see. And so he now has been invited to come and see, and that's when we hear in the passage, Jesus began to weep. He joins in the weeping. His face, too, was wet with tears. Jesus began to weep. Those words strike a chord deep within us. Who here has never wept? Has never known loss? Has never cried with our friends? Jesus knows what it is to lose someone you love. He knows first hand. And it didn't matter that Jesus would soon be, or not, sorry, back up. It didn't matter to Jesus that Lazarus would soon be raised. It didn't tamp down his grief knowing that Lazarus would be resurrected. And I think that that shows us that grief is legitimate. There are some Christian circles where Followers are told to to not grieve, don't cry, it's okay, everything's going to be okay in the end. Just get past this grief. Get over it. But Jesus himself is crying, is weeping with those who mourn. And in his tears, we see the depth of compassionate connection. It says he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved when he saw Mary and the other mourners weeping. He was raised in the Jewish culture where mourning happens in community. Sometimes when we are grieving ourselves, it feels better to not have a lot of people around us. We need our space. We need to be alone. But... Sometimes we do need the presence of others crying alongside us. All grieving is different. No experience of grief looks the same. But it doesn't ever have to be solitary. We can lean on one another. It's a holy and very tender call to cry alongside those who mourn. Over the weekend, I I traveled down to Houston to be with family, uh, and I listened to an audiobook on the way called A Heart That Works. It's by Rob Delaney. He's an actor and comedian. And this book is a memoir where he reflects upon the loss of his two-and-a-half-year-old son to cancer. It's a beautiful work, and I highly recommend it, but if a lot of curse words bother you, maybe avoid this one. Sometimes curse words are the very best things we have, though, to respond to impossible grief. So toward the end of the book, he's writing about how he and his wife had just received the news that the cancer had returned. This is after over a year of treatments, surgeries, chemotherapy, a lot of other um, disabling events that changed their family. And they decided to stop treatment because it was just going to be too hard on his little body to keep going with the rigor of everything that treatment required. So they started telling other people about the cancer returning, and that they were not going to be undergoing any further treatment. There were a range of reactions, and he shared some of them in the book. 
and he writes about this one in particular. He says, one night soon after they received the news, I told one of Henry's night carers, Rachel, that his cancer had returned and that he was going to die. She yelled, oh no, oh Henry, oh Jesus Christ, no. She recoiled from the news like I'd hit her. No, 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 she continued. Yes, yes, I thought. Her, water, her, her words were like water in the desert to me. Rachel was from Nigeria and a mom and a devout Christian. Maybe one or more of these factors explained her response. I don't know. Rachel, thank you for gasping in pain and sadness when you learned Henry would die. In the years since, I think of it often as the absolute best response I received. It helped me. I think that for some of us, when we hear the story of her reaction, we might think that she maybe centered herself too much in that reaction. And she should have been more attentive to how Rob and his wife were feeling about it all. But he said that her words were like water in the desert. He needed to see someone feeling the pain like they were. Debbie Thomas writes about this story that it is the shared lament that leads to transformation. Shared lament is a powerful, powerful thing. She says it's because Jesus experiences the devastation of death that he recognizes the immediate need to restore life. And she wonders, maybe Jesus' tears can provoke us in similar ways. What is it that breaks our hearts? What is it that enrages us to the point of breakdown? She poses the question, can our sorrow lead to justice? For me, hearing these questions makes me think of the trans community here in Texas and in many other states right now. There are anti-trans bills before the Texas legislature, which is in session right now. If that's one of the things that breaks your heart, that enrages you, like it does me, I invite you to join me at the Capitol tomorrow. There's a rally starting in the morning. That's just one example of the many things in our hurting and broken world that need our attention, that moves us to tears. And when we shake with anger and are moved to tears, we are moved to act. Another aspect of this story that Debbie Thomas points out is that all throughout John's Gospel, we see signs. And this sign was not just a sign of Jesus' divinity, of his closeness to God, but this miracle is the precipitating event that leads to Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. Word spreads about what happened with Lazarus and the authorities decide that Jesus must be stopped. So he knew that this was the beginning of the end. And to quote Debbie Thomas again, she says, in crying, he asserts powerfully that it is okay to yearn for life. It is okay to cling to this beautiful world. It's okay to feel a sense of wrongness in the face of death. Death is the enemy the aberration, the thief. 
Death is the thief, and this story is one of many that point us to the power of God. The power that has the last word to turn something long dead into something alive once again. In these last weeks before we remember Jesus' death and celebrate his resurrection, may we hold close to this good news that Jesus is with us in our pain. He knows it firsthand. May we hold close to the good news that we are called to the holy work of walking alongside one another through all of our griefs. May we hold on close to the good news that our hearts will be broken and will be opened up to help bring about new life and transformation. And may we hold close to the good news that God sends us into this beautiful, brutal world to help make real God's love and the new life we have in Christ. Please pray with me. O oh God, full of empathy and love, you have shown us through your holy word that you hear the cries of sorrow and grief from your creation. Help us to hear these cries and through the power of your mighty love, respond by giving of our time, talents, and treasures to join you in the caretaking of all of creation. May we be not afraid to go in or near places of power because of concern of our own well-being. Rather, may we, just as Jesus did, set aside our fears and go where our grieving siblings are. May the sorrows and fears of your creation compel us to action. Use us to protect the expansive beauty and varied expressions of your creation. Teach us to ever more deeply love the talents that you have given drag queens, the fullness of love that you reveal to us through transgender and binary people, and the bravery of authors whose writings tell the stories of aspects of your creation that many people in power would like to erase. May we, like Jesus, weep. And may we, like Jesus, put our love into action. Amen. You can give of your time and talents in many ways to share the good news of the resurrection and life. There's a QR code in your bulletin and a basket um, where you can place an offering in the narthex. You can join rallies at the Capitol, buy books at a bookstore, go to a drag show. Those are ways that we can love as God loves us.
Loving God, we give thanks for the beauty and peacefulness that we wake up to each day, for flowers, grass, and trees blooming. We pray that all those in the world whose lives have been affected and dis disrupted by weather or wars may soon wake to the same beauty and peace that we enjoy. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Sunday school, we had a really wonderful conversation that wouldn't have been possible without the voices and experiences and scripture reading of everyone in that room. Then Pastor Megan's beautiful sermon 
about grieving and how we do that together. And then Cody's lovely offertory about the ways in which we are called to be a body of Christ. Siblings, we come to this table not just to remember the life and ministry and death and resurrection. We come to remember who we are individually and collectively. We come together to eat from one loaf, not just this congregation, not just from this table, but for all the people of God. We are one together. Siblings, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. According to his commandment, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. Lord of life, you call us out of our dark places, offering us the grace of new life. When we see nothing but hopelessness, you surprise us with the breath of your spirit. Call us out of our complacency and routines. Unbind us from our self-imposed bonds and fill us with your spirit of life, compassion, and peace. We thank you for your life, sacrifice, death, and resurrection that show us the path to eternal life with you. We thank you for these symbols that represent your body and blood. We thank you that they help us remember your unfailing love for us. Feed us and fill us with your spirit that we may carry the good news of your love to all who will hear. Let us be your hands, feet, and voice in a world that longs for good news. In the name of the Anointed One, we pray. Amen. Siblings, when you are ready, you are invited to come forward and receive the elements. There will be an elder on either side down here. You are invited to partake of the bread, which is going to be in a little cup first. We also have a little cup of juice. It is our tradition to take the juice together, so if you're comfortable, bring the juice back to your seat with you. If not, you may go ahead and have it there. The bread is gluten-free and delicious. The cup is grape juice. If you are not able to come forward during communion, I will bring communion to you. Siblings, this table is open for all who want to dine here. If you feel inclined to partake in this feast, you are welcome. So come and dine, for all has been prepared for you.
Siblings, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, blood of Christ, the cup of new life. Amen. Friends, we are so grateful that all of you have been gathered here today to worship with us. Whether you are here in person or you are here online, you are welcome. If you are considering membership in this body of Christ, we would invite you to either talk to Pastor Megan or myself this week. Or if you are ready to join, you are invited to come forward during the singing of our final hymn, which we will now all rise and sing together. Gideon has come forward. <laughs> Gideon White is joining with our family of faith after visiting with us for over a year now. <laughs> and we are so grateful for you and the ministry of love that you bring to the world. So if you would all turn to number 341 in your hymnals, we are going to um, officially, as a group, collectively welcome Gideon um, to our body. Um, so, a couple questions, since you're here. <laughs> Do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus the Christ? Absolutely. 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 Wonderful. And do you promise to continue following in the way of Jesus, to grow in faith 
and to participate in the life and mission of this community of God's people? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. Yay. <laughs> and now, church, we're going to make some promises, too. So let's join together in number 341, welcoming a new member. Reaffirming our own faith in Jesus the Christ, we gladly welcome you into this community of faith, enfolding you with our love and committing ourselves to your care. In the power of God's Spirit, let us mutually encourage each other to trust God and strengthen one another to serve others, that Christ's church may in all things stand faithful. Woohoo! Wonderful. We are so happy that you are amongst us. Um, okay, so Gideon is going to be out in the narthex if you would like to uh, welcome them to the life of the church. And uh, yeah, we're very, very happy. So uh, I'm doing a walk out. Okay. Yeah. So before all of that, though, we are going to share in the benediction. And I'd like to remind you that we are staying seated to. Uh, enjoy the postlude as part of our Lenten practice. So, now receive this benediction. Beloved, as you go from here, may you know, share, and rejoice in the immeasurable love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus. Go in God's goodness, grace, and peace to love and serve. Amen. <laughs>